and uh, we'll get started because I know we have uh, probably a 30 minute presentation today so we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, we'll just get started. Uh, today we're going to talk once again about running AI models on the edge. This is part two follow on of a previous conversation. Um, so for those of you who haven't been to a tech talk, welcome. Uh, we're here every Thursday, 1230 Eastern. Uh, we're going for, I think, 52 talks this year. So we're hoping to have one every single week um, and continue to, to run them. Uh, these are supposed to be kind of conversations, not necessarily presentations. So please join us uh, either live or head over, you know, if you're watching this on YouTube or something, head over to our Discord and try to participate in the conversation. We'd love to have you, love to have your ideas. Uh, I mentioned, you know, we've already done a bunch of these. Uh, we have a whole bunch of great topics that we've done in the last, I don't know, month or two, and we are going to be referencing some of these in today's talk, uh, containerizing models with chassis. I'm going to chat about uh, AI hardware. Obviously, we're going to talk about um, building APIs for AI. Uh, and then, of course, this is a part two, so we're also going to be talking, uh, referencing the previous uh, talk that Seth gave on running AI at the edge. Uh, so yeah, last time Seth walked us through the Edge concept, um, our new support for it. Uh, he walked through the history, why we would want to use Edge, a few of the hurdles that developers encounter when running on the Edge and some of the considerations that folks use uh, doing that. But uh, so today we're going to use that as a starting off point because at the very end of Seth's chat, he teased a little bit. He said, um, next time we're going to be doing real world examples with useful uh, quote unquote functional applications of AI on the edge, uh, specifically on a Raspberry Pi and a Jetson Nano. Um, so today we're going to do that. Uh, the Jetson I think is going to be the far more interesting. Uh, we're going to be running actually a computer vision model on the edge, disconnected, uh, standalone, but managed by our edge services. Um, someone will take care of that in the second half, but for the first part, uh, I'm just going to go over a much simpler example that's a sensor generating time series data, uh, and then we're going to analyze that. Um, the simple case uh, just allows me to do kind of an end-to-end -end, uh, demonstration of everything that's involved to really give you all a sense of the power that, that our EDGE offering has uh, and the power of just running models at the edge in general with or without Monty. Um, so it, it might get a little techy, but this is a tech talk. So to get started, uh, what I want to build is uh, an air quality sensor, an AQI sensor. Uh, basically it just measures the quality of the air you're breathing, how much particulate matter, toxins, smoke, uh, that sort of thing. It tells you, you know, whether you should go outside or not, basically. Um, but what I want to do is not just build a sensor to detect air quality, I also want to run a machine learning algorithm to predict air quality in the next hour or day or uh, whatever is relevant. Um, so I want to add a little bit more complexity. And I'm going to base that, as we can see, around a Raspberry Pi. Uh, this is great, you know, hobbyist consumer class hardware. Uh, it's got some connectivity options, some Wi-Fi, some Ethernet. Uh, but no GPU, so we can't develop a, an AI algorithm relying on a GPU. And of course, the most important thing is that it's 30 bucks. So I could, you know, just as an individual, I can run this uh, as a company, potentially, you know, maybe I wouldn't use the Raspberry Pi, but for a similar spec device, I could deploy hundreds or thousands of these out uh, to do whatever task that I have to do. So beyond the Raspberry Pi, I'm gonna add a couple of sensors. Uh, on the left, the blue one is the PM25 air quality sensor. Uh, it just looks for particulate matter, you know, two, two and a half, ten micrometer. Uh, if you've ever seen like a PM2.5 reading, this is the kind of sensor that will get that. And on the right is uh, just to add a little bit to that, we're going to detect CO2 temperature and humidity of the surrounding environment. And all these will play into our ultimate model. Uh, so I assembled these, I gave it a nice USB swag power source um, and created a standalone sensor that I could drag around, put anywhere I want and record data. 
Uh, on the right, you'll see the wiring diagram. And just so that you all know, uh, everything mentioned here is on docs.modzi.com. So if you, you know, I'm gonna go pretty quick, but if you wanna follow along and wire everything up, get our bill of materials, uh, get all the step-by-step -step instructions of installing that software, it is all available uh, so you can do that yourself. So now that I have a uh, hardware platform anyway, I want to actually add some logging code. So we're going to uh, just, I, I've written a very, very simple set of code here. Uh, basically all it does is initialize those two sensors that we created and then it drops into an infinite loop that'll just write the sensor readings out to a log file every five seconds. That's all it does, not a lot of complexity, I'm not even running error handling. Um, you can jump into this and edit as you, as you see fit, but this, is, this script is available on our GitHub repo uh, and again you can see it in our documentation site. So if I run this script on the Pi itself, uh, I've actually set it up to run every single time uh, the Pi boots up, but we're just gonna start seeing data come through every five seconds. It's in a CSV, it's time series, we're looking at it, uh, you know, this is our CO2 right now, 809, 811, uh, all these are zeros, that's good, those are the particulate matter readings. Um, so it means I'm breathing pretty darn healthy air. Um, but we can see that that is in fact working. So what I did was take this simple code and I just ran it for about a month. Uh, that gave me a whole bunch of data uh, and I'm gonna use that data to train a model to hopefully predict the next hour. So I grabbed that data. Um, I'm just gonna load it up into this Jupyter Notebook so that I can explore it a little bit. We got 665,000 lines of data uh, it's not quite in the realm of big data yet, but I think that's plenty. Uh, we can kind of get a good look at it down here, looking at our PM numbers, our CO2 numbers. It all looks very, very reasonable. Um, and so I think this is good data. If I want to explore it a little bit more, maybe I'll make some graphs, definitely see some daily highs and lows uh, as you know, this particular variable, CO2, gets a little bit higher as the afternoon goes on, probably mostly due to me sitting here in this room. Uh, we can see over here a little nice flat spot. That was when I went on vacation for a weekend. Uh, I wasn't sitting here breathing nasty CO2 on the sensor, so it does seem to be working. Uh, if we want to explore, you know, maybe look at all the rest of the variables, they all look pretty good. Uh, you know, you might see some of these spikes, like this PM 2.5 and 10, there's a nice spike here. Data scientist and you might say, hey, let's clean that up. That's clearly outlier data. Uh, but this has already been cleaned and those little spikes are actually, I, I would consider them good indicators that the sensor itself is working uh, because that was the day that I burned dinner and so we got some nice smoke up near the sensor. So it is working, we're getting really good data. So what's our next step? We're gonna use this data and actually train a model. Uh, I'm going to pull it in, sample it on the timestamp. Uh, I want a one hour prediction time, so I'm going to say 3600 seconds, and I'm going to use a variable, it's actually a one hour rolling average. This just gets a little bit of the noise out of that raw CO2 value. Uh, and just a side note, the reason I'm using CO2 instead of uh, the actual AQI or PM2.5 is just because CO2 has a lot more variability, and so I can uh, instead of just predicting zero constantly, this, uh, this actually has meaning. So anyway, data scientists will see this and say, hey, you're doing pretty standard. We're breaking our data into test and training sets. Uh, we're running uh, a model fit down here. Um, you know, after I actually tested maybe a half dozen different model architectures, uh, and after a lot of discussion with Samuel and other colleagues, we decided on a support vector regression model which is a type of support vector machine. Uh, but you know, if you want to come by and ask us exactly why we chose this and exactly how uh, it really fits this data, we invite you to come over and ask some questions. Uh, but basically, uh, this generally works well with cyclical time series data. So we trained it. Uh, these values here were part of a, a little tuning process, very, very rough still. I didn't feel the need to get this exceptionally precise. Uh, but once we run that model, we see, yeah, uh, 
Uh, based on the training data, it matches pretty well, so we run it on some test data, and it's pretty darn good. The predicted value and the actuals probably match within about 10%, and if you look at some of those error values and you know, uh, the, the metrics there, they match very, very well. Uh, so good enough for our work today. So now I've got a model. I, I logged data, I trained the model based on that data. My next step is I want to actually package that model up into a container um, and so that I can run it on my device. So I mentioned we're referencing chassis. I'm going to use chassis. Basically, I import it. Uh, I define that process function. Uh, you know, go back to our previous chats on, on chassis to really dive into what this is, but it's basically the same code that I ran up above in the notebook. Um, and I'm going to create a result and return that. So if I process Y, my result is 733, which if we jump up here to the training, that does in fact match uh, this 733 for our prediction. So after packaging it uh, into that process function, we're still getting the same result. That's expected. Next, we'll create a chassis client. Uh, here you'll see I'm using the brand new uh, Modsy free chassis service. Uh, you can go to the chassis site and figure out how to sign up, but basically it's a free service. If you don't want to use that, we can still run at localhost, obviously. Um, but I generate that chassis client and then create a chassis model. Very, very fast, uh, but I test that chassis model and again, same result. Highly expected, but good as a sanity check. Uh, if I want to, I could generate uh, a file with that data. That's one of the benefits of chassis. It just does file handling, so I don't have to necessarily send a byte array. I could do files, uh, AWS S3 buckets, uh, a variety of data sources. Chassis will take care of a lot of that for us. But the last step is just actually publish that model. Uh, I gave it a name, model version, uh, and then right here, this has nothing to do with Modsy. I'm just telling uh, Chassis to actually push that model, that container file, on up to Docker Hub. So then I can download it, put it anywhere I want, independent of Modsy uh, if I want. I don't need a Modsy instance to run Chassis. Uh, I will get those containers wherever I want them to be, uh, however I want them. But because I do, in this instance, want to use Modsy for its edge management, I am going to simultaneously push this model up to my Modsy instance uh, so that it'll be available there. Really this last line is the important one for this case. I'm telling Chassis to compile this container for an ARM64 processor because that's what I'm running with my Raspberry Pi uh, versus you know, running it on an Intel or an ARM32. Uh, I'm telling Chassis what to do here. So I submitted this. Uh, it took about four and a half minutes, and my result was success. And that's all it took. I loaded that data, trained that model, and then published that model as a containerized model uh, to both Docker Hub and Modsy. So let's just jump over. Uh, this is my Modsy instance. We'll go to models, we'll go to my models, and there we are, my AQI arm sensor. Um, obviously, I haven't used it yet, but this matches. This is exactly what I published uh, earlier today. Um, so it's here and in Modsy and available to start making predictions. So from there, I want to say, hey, let's actually grab, let's create uh, an edge device group, and let's load that model onto my edge device, and let's run it. It's as simple as making a device group. Let's call it Tech Talk. Uh, I want to add a model, so I want to go ahead and add that ARM sensor model that I just uploaded, uh, and I'll create a new device group. It should show up here. I can't remember what I called it. Uh, Tech Talk. There it is. <laughs> uh, we have our AQI sensor running, uh, but we don't have any devices yet. So our next step will be to create a device token. I always like to have uh, a bunch of time and uses for my tokens so that I can develop and uh, mess around with them. But again, we're going to make it as easy as possible. I'm running a 64-bit ARM chip, so I'm going to generate those commands, and all I'm going to do is copy them. Uh, from here, you know, 
this at this point we do have to uh, be connected to the internet at large uh, just because we're running this wget on our local instance of modsy this dev.modsy uh, and then we're actually running that and then we're starting up that server so let's once again jump over here where we're still watching that log and all we're going to do is paste that command we just copied over first thing it'll do is download that modsy core uh, it's about 38 megabytes so this takes you know 10 seconds or so depending on your connection next thing it'll do is modify that to be executable and then it should uh, just run it'll download the uh, It'll synchronize with Modsy. It'll then download that container file that we told it to. Right now it's creating that container. And then in a few seconds, it'll say, yay, container is ready and running. So it's running and it's ready. Uh, what do we do now? Well, we have one more snippet of code uh, for you to look at. So we'll jump back over here. This little snippet, again, very, very simple script available on our GitHub. Uh, the, for those of you familiar with Modsy, you'll see a lot of similarity. The only difference is of, of, you know, running normal, normal uh, models. The only difference is we're importing an edge client here instead of our normal client. And we're using a local host uh, URL um, so that we're actually running everything right on the edge. We could be disconnected. Uh, we don't need the internet anymore. Uh, and then the last little change is this port 55,000 uh, configurable, but that's what I happen to be running it at right now. We do a little bit of code here, setting up GPIOs. Uh, all this is is setting up my lights so that they're red, yellow, green, depending on the air quality. Uh, just a little bit of, of uh, hardware hacking for those of you who love it. Then we're going to load the data. Same thing, you know basically copy and paste it from that Jupyter notebook. We load the log file that we're generating. Uh, we put it into a data frame and we just pass that data frame on. Very simple. And then again, something that all Modsy developers will be highly familiar with. We submit. We submit to that particular model and same thing that we saw in the Jupyter notebook. We're submitting uh, that data. And then we get the results back and return them and other than that, we're just doing a loop where we do that. We pull in the data, run the data through the prediction engine, and then write it out to a log and print it to the file. And we do that every five seconds. Uh, but that's it. It's, it's fairly simple. It might seem complex, uh, but it's really just a few lines of code. And so if we, again, jump over to our terminal, Here's another new SSH terminal into our Raspberry Pi, and I'm just going to run that script that we were just reviewing. Uh, it'll take a couple seconds while it configures all those GPIOs to turn the LEDs on and off, uh, and it'll probably, yeah, it always gives us warnings because I'm, uh, those GPIOs were originally intended for some other use. But now we're starting to get our first predictions. Uh, the current 792, and it's predicting it's probably going to go down over the next hour. Um, I actually have a sensor right here. If I blow on it, you know, this is every five seconds and it is a little bit of an averaged value, so it might take a few seconds um, to actually start changing. But we're going to see, okay, 911 from 792. Uh, it should continue to go up for a few seconds. And then as this uh, goes up and holds that higher value, you're going to start to see that next hour prediction spike up. Um, but that is it. We started from scratch, started from a Raspberry Pi. We logged a bunch of data. We trained the, uh, a new model based on that data, deployed it to Modsy. Uh, we pulled that model down and are now running it locally on a Raspberry Pi where it's generating inferences. Uh, in real time with very, very little lag, very fast, and we did it all uh, in about 15 minutes. So I hope you see the power in that, even though it's a, a pretty simple use case, that's pretty incredible. Um, so for the next use case, I'm going to turn it over to Samuel, and he's going to show us how we can run uh, computer vision on our, our systems.
Yeah, thanks, Brent. So just to sort of uh, set the scene, imagine you are a supervisor at a construction site and you've got a policy in place where everyone needs to be wearing hard hats at all times. Uh, unfortunately, as we know, folks don't always follow the rules or they might just forget to put it on. And so maybe you want to put on a siren uh, every time someone is detected not wearing a hard hat. Uh, could you hit play, please? So we've got this uh, SSD mobile net architecture object detection model. Uh, this was not run at the edge. I ran this inference on this video on my laptop. But just to give you guys a sense of what this is doing, it can detect people, hard hats, and vests. Uh, we're not going to be using the vest capability today, but it can do that as well. All right, so after this, uh, what I did is I packaged it up using the uh, Modsy gRPC template, the open model interface template. Got uh, some information on that on the docs site if you're interested. But uh, package that up and then build that container for an ARM processor, which uh, Edge devices typically use. My Jetson Nano is no exception. Deployed that model to Modsy and then went through a similar process that Brett did. So, configuring a device group, enabling this model within that device group, getting that token, and then spinning up Modsy Edge on my actual Edge device. Um, which then pulls down that model, spins it up, and gets it ready for inference. So before I actually run this, and hopefully this works as expected, I would like to show you my sort of experimental setup here. So I'm going to switch cameras. Looks like that worked. All right, so here we've got the Jetson Nano. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it is basically just a small computer with a GPU on board that's going to allow us to do uh, the computations required to run neural networks more efficiently. And then we've got this webcam here that is going to capture video frames and submit them. Uh, we'll be submitting those frames to the model directly. And then if I am detected not wearing a hard hat, then this siren is going to go off. And then as soon as I put that hard hat in the back on, hopefully the siren is going to turn off. All right, so I'm gonna switch back to the other camera and let's go ahead and kick this off. Give me one second here. All right. Give it a second to spin up. All right, so I was detected not wearing a hard hat and the siren went off. And now if I put this on, it might take a couple seconds, but it should go off. And it looks like it does. All right. Let's go ahead and take it off and then see if it turns back on. And it looks like it did. So let me go ahead and turn this off. So to sort of recap, everything that you saw was running on this Jetson Nano device. Uh, went through a very similar process to what Brett did, but with a computer vision model this time. Um, and this is just sort of, uh, just showed you a couple of toy examples, but hopefully this starts to give you a sense of the sort of things that are possible with Modsy Edge. Um, go back to the slides, please, Brett. Uh, can we go to the previous slide? So just to sort of recap a few of the key characteristics of Modsy Edge, um, super easy to get up and running. So uh, as Brett demonstrated, you configure your device group, enable a couple of models there, and you get that token. And then on your actual Edge device, only a few commands are required, and you just pass that token. Uh, and then at that point, we've got everything that we need. Modsy Edge will go ahead and pull those models down, spin them up, and uh, expose gRPC and REST interfaces for you to start submitting inference jobs. It's that easy. Uh, as far as flexibility, we've purposefully built this product in a very flexible fashion, and that applies in terms of uh, operating systems, processor types, model, model types, uh, frameworks that you use, input data formats if you've got video or audio or you know uh, CO2 readings coming in. All of that is supported. Uh, if you want to update, if you want to add a new version of a model or a new model altogether, super easy to do that as well uh, within the, the Edge Operations dashboard in the UI. All you got to do is deploy your new model and enable that new model within your device group, and then you spin up Mod Z Edge again on your actual Edge device, and it'll handle the rest for you and get that new model up and running. 
And then finally, uh, we can run an offline mode as well. As long as that model has already been deployed to the edge device, we'll be able to run that without network connectivity, no problem. So just a little bit more detail on how this works, and I see that we're running out of time, so I won't take too much time here. Um, in the UI, again, configure device group. You can have multiple devices uh, assigned to that device group, and you can enable one or more models. On the right, starting at the bottom, on the actual edge device, we can support different processor types, models that require GPU, different operating systems. When you spin up Mozzie Edge, it'll pull down the models assigned to that device group and expose both the REST and GRPC interface for you to submit jobs and then also get back the results and actually do something um, with those results. And that is facilitated by the Edge client that Brett showed within the Mozzie SDK. Um, so pretty easy to use there. And again, to sort of drive home that point on flexibility, uh, we can support almost any combination of processor types, operating systems, or devices. If you're running on Raspberry Pi or Jetson Nano, uh, like we showed today, or a smart camera, uh, maybe you're running computer vision models on a drone tracking vehicles, for example, or you've got a more powerful edge device like an HPE edge line. Uh, we've built Monzi Edge in a way that supports all of these different scenarios. Uh, and now I'm gonna hand it back over to Brett to talk about just a few potential use cases. Yeah, and I see, you know, we're we're just about out of time and I want to be respectful, but I hope like, you know, just seeing this inspires a whole bunch of, of thoughts and ideas of how to use it. You know, anything from running it on video cameras, uh, like Samuel showed, to uh, running it on wearables or out, you know, hundreds of them running on remote facilities, monitoring environmental conditions, that sort of thing. Uh, what we showed here today really was just the beginning, you know, to take a, a chapter out of Seth's handbook. Maybe we'll tease a little bit uh, in another month or two, we'll do another edge presentation. Um, we could extend this out so that uh, like something like that AQI sensor continuously retrains itself, generates a new model on the data that it's been logging for that day or that week. Uh, it could be made unique so that a model running in my bedroom is running a completely different uh, set of weights and scenarios than a model running in the garage. Because of course, uh, those qualities could be different and we can fully handle that. Uh, and it's something that, something that you should definitely consider when running AI at the edge. Um, so again, hope this was inspiring and that you have some ideas on how to use this or how to run AI going forward. If you do, we'd love to hear them. So join us in the general voice channel or anytime uh, jump on our Discord. And I hope you try one of these two uh, out on your own systems. And thanks for your time. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone.